All right, Tanya, welcome. Where are you calling us from today for those in Australia? I am calling from Northern India in the lower Himalayas. It's a place called Dharamshala. From Dharamshala. And tell me, um, what time is it for you to, at this time? 1.30 p.m. So it's oh, a this is a nice little lunch break for you because it's 5.30 for yeah. us and it's breakfast time for Stefan in the UK. Um, so, all right, I will pass you and just tell me when you want me to move slides across or anything like that. Um, it is really such a treat to have you here. So I'll monitor the chat room. So don't worry about any of that. Um, and, and Graham and everyone is here as well. So uh, I'm just really excited to, to have you here to be a part of this. Yeah, me too. Thanks, Will. And I'm really excited to be here and talk about something that I'm really passionate about and uh, continue learning about. So uh, yeah, thanks for being here, all of you. And um, we can start by just moving to the next slide. But I'll just share a little bit. So um, so my name is Tanya Jinwala and uh, I'm a psychologist and an adventure and nature-based therapist in India. And I thought I could start by just sharing a little bit of a context of, of who I am and where I'm calling from. So as I said earlier, I live in the lower Himalayas in Northern India and um, just to describe the landscape uh, and the nature around me, it's a lot of um, pine forests and little hills and not so little mountains. And um, uh, the work that uh, we do is I run an organization called Qualia and we run outdoor therapy programs um, for folks from different parts of the country. Um, and maybe I can tell you a little bit about the work that I do so that there's some context to what we're talking about uh, today. And I'll also share a little bit about where I'm drawing from and some of my influences as well. So uh, just a bit about the program that we run. It's, it's open to anyone who wants to apply. So it's application based and we take people out in small groups. Um, usually for me, eight is a really magical number. So, um, and we go hiking uh, around the Tholadar Mountains, which is the mountains around home. And a big part of the work that we do is collaborating with the Gaddi community. And the Gaddi community is a semi-nomadic uh, pastoral tribe that's actually fast vanishing. Um, we collaborate with a, a small village um, just a little bit outside uh, the town where I live. And um, there are very few, so most of the people in this community are farmers and shepherds and also you know, taxi drivers and have different um, services that they offer. Uh, but uh, largely there's a lot of urban migration that's happening and we're collaborating with this project to um, one is just just support the Gadi community to um, value like their lived experiences as, and the wisdom that they have as they move through the world and the mountains. Uh, we really feel sad that there's a lot of that is lost um, just to, to urban migration and, you know, thanks to capitalism and uh, colonialism in different ways, we, we're losing some of the, these wise ways of um, navigating and connecting with nature. So um, that's a big part of, of um, the work that we do. And so we work with youth and women in the community and you'll see some of them because I'm going to share a little uh, short video where we talk about um, just to show you a bit a glimpse of um, the program. And then a few other points about the program is that uh, apart from preserving Gaddi culture, uh, we also really feel very, very safe uh, going up in the mountains with our team um, because they've been, you know, they've grown up running up and down these mountains. So it's a big part of how we also uh, address safety, both physical, emotional and social. So I'll, we'll be talking more about that today. 
Um, the whole point of the program that we do is to create a contrasting experience to what people are usually experiencing on an everyday basis in their lives, right? So it's really about um, this particular program is focused on slowing down, on connecting with our bodies, on connecting people with community. Because while, uh, of course, uh, you know, there are so many mental health uh, practitioners in India and individual one-on-one -on -one therapy is something that is very, quite common, uh, we're still a sort of in between like a collectivistic and individualistic culture somewhere and our roots are more collectivistic. And I feel that adventure therapy really offers um, the opportunity for community building, for building relationships. Like my favorite part of the program is that people go away with connections just uh, within themselves and it really reduces the reliance on a professional for support. And it creates a web of, you know, linked lives and uh, shared lived experiences, which I believe is, is very powerful. And it also restores a sense of belonging. So that's really the focus and I could talk more about that but maybe we'll leave time at the end if you have any questions. Um, so I'll just uh, show a little uh, two minute video and maybe that'll give you a sense of the space uh, and context for the, what we do. So maybe I can share my video, uh, share my screen with you. Yep. Go for it. You better let me know if you can hear it. Yeah, I will. Yep, we got it. shot is my favorite because it was us um, coming up with a spontaneous uh, ritual to just while we were leaving camp and uh, it's really nice because it's something that we co-created together just to say bye to the campsite that we called home mm -hmm. um, so yeah these are some of just some glimpses of how we're uh, connecting with the local community connecting with each other and with the land as well and ourselves and our bodies. So it's uh, really exciting to share that with you. Uh, we can move to the next slide. 
And just a few things. Uh, I'm sure most of you are watching a recording, but if you're here uh, on the call, just want you to invite you to take care of you or whatever that looks like. If you need to be lying down or keeping your video off, that's perfectly fine. Although it would be nice to see faces, but also totally all right. Um, and yeah, just a couple of things that are on the screen that you can have a look at. Uh, I'm hoping this can be more interactive and uh, you can put stuff in the chat or and towards the end maybe just unmute and share um, as well but yeah it would be nice to hear from whoever's here and to take deep breaths as we navigate all of this information i've tried to keep it quite simple so just to start with uh, this is one of the also the campsites uh, for our programs and I wanted to start with why why this topic because when Will approached me this was sort of the first thing that came up for me and um, I feel like a lot of outdoor groups in India and uh, programs and trainings as well that I've been a part of haven't really addressed emotional safety and there's a la largely a, uh, a focus that's more on physical safety and I, I know that um, often it's, you know, it shows up in, in different ways. And I always was left wondering, you know, um, how how do we address that emotional safety, safety, even though it's been around for such a long time. It's been around since the 70s, this term, but somehow there is, doesn't usually translate uh, in the ways that it potentially can. And this shows up as, you know, even on a wilderness first responder course, sometimes like skipping through the mental health bits and not realizing that emotional and physical safety are very deeply interlinked as well. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And um, yeah, just wanted to focus on why this topic. So I think that uh, the current climate that all of us are working in, it's quite stressful. People are walking into our programs on with uh, anxiety, with depression, and there is a global mental health epidemic. And we also now have access to a lot more neurobiology-based research to show how safety supports and promotes learning and growth and healing. So I think that's important also to bring in. So we'll talk a little bit about that today. And also because now there are more conversations about diversity, and inviting diversity in different spaces. But sometimes I'm not sure we know what to do once that diversity is in the room. Like we need the skills to navigate diversity because with along with diversity comes a lot of complexity and nuanced ways of navigating things like safety, right? So I think it's important to acknowledge that this kind of these conversations go hand in hand with even these move, larger movements around diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging. So that's one thing I think we need to constantly uh, upskill ourselves and learn and unlearn. And I really want to acknowledge, like I was sharing earlier, that I think I gave a similar presentation like a year ago, and so much has changed for me as well in the last year. And I think that's a sign of really continuing to learn. So just uh, acknowledging that, that we're all a work in progress and that we're all just um, learning as we go, you know. So so just take today from this, just take what makes sense and just sit with it for a while and it's okay if not all of it fits right now. And so just important to take your time um, with it, yeah. And uh, we'll also just maybe have some time for questions at the end. So the next slide is about where I'm drawing from today. So these are some of the areas uh, and influences and based on my training and um, interactions with people and the work that I've done so far. And a huge part of that is uh, interacting with folks uh, and friends from the disability community because for four years uh, I've spent time uh, taking folks with physical disabilities outdoors to promote social inclusion. And that's where I really learned so much about my own relationship with my body and how ableism impacts all of us, not just folks with disabilities. So we'll also maybe um, talk a little bit about that. And also uh, recently, uh, 
working with a uh, with Denise Mitten on research on choice and emotional safety has been a real eye opener and uh opened up some very fresh perspectives. We can go to the next slide, please. Really. Yeah, so this is just briefly, uh, I want to focus more on practical tools. And yeah, we talk a little bit about theory, but there's a lot out there to read. And I'm happy to have any of you reach out um, to ask for resources. So I'll try and focus more on the practical tips and uh, ways in which we can apply uh, some of what we're discussing. And the next slide. So I just want to start with uh, having you think of a time where you felt emotionally safe outdoors. It can be on your own or in a group context. So just take a moment to think about a time and see, you know, what images come up or what sounds even. And if it if it's possible to just put them in the chat, that would be nice. But yeah, just seeing what words even come to your mind when you think about a time where you felt safe, especially emotionally. And you probably know a lot about this already. So it's more about harnessing that and then just adding on to that. I'm just going to give a minute. I added mine. It was just a little bit long. Yeah, these thanks for was talking about canoeing with his bulldog and listening to music as he was sleeping in the boat. It was a funny moment because I was waiting for my partner Renee to arrive where we were. So I had to kill time. And so I went out and paddled out and I didn't know how the dog would like being in the boat. And Ridgely, the dog, he cries if he sees me go out by myself now. So it was really lovely. It was a nice, yeah. he was only a puppy, but I see other people adding things now. So, and the word sitting is starting almost everyone's thing, which is really nice. I'll give that back to you, Tanya. Yeah. So just to, just because I think people in the, who watch the recording might miss some of this, but just reading some of them out loud. So thanks for sharing. Just sitting around the campfire with friends after hiking all day, sitting in the forest and listening to the forest sounds and the birds, living in a tiny house surrounded by big trees and nature and perfectly connected and safe. And Graham says sitting still in the jungle at night with zero visibility for hours at a time. Yeah, there's a, another person saying sitting around the fire, being around dogs and horses. Mm. Okay, lying down on the wet grass. Thank you, thank you. So we're going to hold on to these and we're going to come back to them because I'm going to ask some questions at the end. So yeah, thanks for sharing that. We can move to the next slide. I just wanted to briefly share a little bit about my story with how, why emotional safety matters so much to me, because I feel like that there is this joke that for as many adventure therapists as there are at a conference, there are that many ways of practicing adventure therapy. And to a large extent, I believe that our own lived experiences inform uh, how we do this work as well and shape uh, the idea, shape us and our practices, right? So um, for me, I think uh, I had a very deep connection with nature growing up, but uh, also had quite traumatic, uh, not using this word lightly, just traumatic um, and very distressing experiences with adventure and outdoor adventure. So I wasn't very athletic as a kid and it seemed, it felt a lot like, oh, this outdoor adventure thing isn't for me. And uh, that changed a lot when um, I did a diploma in experiential education. So experiential education really 
uh, opened up a whole world for me because I just signed up because I, I saw the word experiential and I was like, oh, this this could be interesting. I had no clue what I was getting into. And um, I didn't know that an outdoor, there was an outdoor component to the program. Um, but when I found out, I was like, oh no, I think this is not going to be fun because in my mind, it was uh, these experiences were associated with a lot of pain, with feeling uh, like I have to keep up, feeling like um, I'm going to be embarrassed if I don't do an activity or I'm going to be coerced into doing it even if I don't want to because usually it's like these school trips where you go on hikes and stuff in really large groups and those were very overwhelming spaces for me um but then when I uh, learned experiential education and got to be in this community and learned from my mentor uh, Vishwas Parchare I realized that I got introduced to like terms like emotional safety and challenge by choice and invitational education. And this was back in um, 2013. And it just opened up a whole world of possibilities and the whole approach to adventure changed for me. And I think I really wouldn't have been uh, even dreamt of being an adventure therapist if I hadn't experienced that kind of safety and reframing of how it's possible to be in these experiences. So we'll talk a little bit more about how uh, restoring choice and agency for people can really heal also traumas uh, for them. And this uh, picture on the very right is uh, the first time I think I could wear a harness again after like 10 or 12 years uh, and felt safe enough and uh, felt pretty joyful while I was at it. So, yeah. You can move to the next slide. So this is a question I think that's really important. Uh, and it, it came up a lot when I was working with folks with disabilities. Um, you know, this question around uh, who really belongs outdoors and, you know, is this really for everyone? And uh, as I mentioned earlier, it really, you know, informed and changed my relationship with my own body and how I engage with outdoor adventure. So very often the outdoor community can undermine emotional safety of marginalized identities and really pose a real physical and emotional threat to the safety of people who are involved in outdoor activities because we've system systematically undercut the confidence of certain genders and races and bodies and sexualities in the outdoor adventure field by marketing the outdoors mostly to people who've historically been represented in them. And um, how we define adventure as well impacts who feels invited into an experience, right? And who chooses to participate. So very often conventional understandings of adventure are loaded with ableist ideas and discourses around like physical strength and challenge. So um, uh, at Qualia, we offer programs that are focused on like hiking, slow hiking. So really slowing it down and we even call it the slow retreat. And somehow I really have noticed that it attracts a very different audience because when you say, oh, this is going to be hiking that slowed down, people who um, are hiking for the very first time and have never tried it uh, will approach us and say, hey, I want to do this. People with chronic pain, who are um, on, you know, just navigating that or on their way to healing uh, physically are open to joining. There are folks who are neurodivergent or queer who feel like, oh, okay, maybe this is, it's possible for me to access adventure in this way. So that's been really interesting. That wasn't necessarily the intention, but it's sort of shaped up like that which is really fun. So I think even how we name things really matters. And this can be a very important step towards making adventure therapy more equitable and inclusive for people who belong to communities that haven't always been uh, felt welcome. And um, yeah, I think also through narrative therapy, just learning about uh, deconstructing these dominant ideas around who, who's meant to be here. And there's a lot of interesting research and reading on that. So feel free to reach out. 
um, to me for that. Yeah. Tanya, and can I ask you a, a question? Is it okay yeah. I interrupt you? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering if you could, for those that might not be all that aware of narrative therapy, what one of the things I I, I taught a bit of narrative therapy last week, and and I thought this was so cool that I that I was reading all this stuff, and I really loved it. Can you explain a little bit how even working with one person, even if there is systematic things that are not in that person's favor, like our maybe ableist views, one person can't change that per se. So I wonder how does helping that person deconstruct the narratives that are kind of imposed on them by society, I wonder what your view is on how, how is that also narrative therapy is also activism isn't it so so how i i just want to know your view on that i'm i'm, I'm throwing yeah. this to you because I, I i i've been thinking about this all week and i um i love what you're saying oh yeah and i think I, what you said is really accurate like it is activism in the sense that this is an approach a therapeutic approach that's rooted in also social justice and in externalizing uh, often what has been internalized. So I'll give an, maybe my own example, right? Like before I, I learned about ableism, I, I was constantly kept thinking there's something lacking within me that I need to be physically a certain way to be an adventure therapist, that I need to look a certain way, I need to be able to move at a certain speed. Uh, and I didn't know that all of these things actually are uh, ableist ideas that are very sneaky. So often these discourses are very sneaky and we end up internalizing a sense of personal failure when actually these are, um, you know, uh, ideas and that are sort of have a grip on us more um, externally. And that these are systemic um you know challenges and ideas right that are rooted very deeply into the systems that we're embedded in and a part of what i hope that this conversation we're having sort of spurs in each of us is really looking at the system that that you are embedded in and seeing what ideas you're bringing into that therapy room as a result of that so i think it really helps to uh it helped me to reclaim a sense of agency and choice and power by uh, not internalizing this sense of personal failure, but really externalizing it and naming it, you know, and saying, hey, yeah, this is um, this is because of ableism and this is not because there's something lacking in me. And it created a real sense of acceptance that the outdoors are for everyone, anyone who's willing and uh, wants to engage with it. So... Uh, narrative therapy is a non-blaming sort of approach and it's a it's a way in which actually also very collaborative it's about collaborating to make meaning with um a participants and people who uh, consult us so that's a little bit i can go on for a long time but uh one last thing i'll say is that we really believe in the narrative approach that people are always responding so even when uh, there is systemic oppression that they're faced with, people are uh, doing little acts of resistance to to respond uh, to uh, to that systemic oppression and reclaim that agency. And through these conversations, we make those little acts, and that are often not so little actually, make them more visible uh, to to people as well. Does that help? You're muted. Hold on okay. one second. I don't know what I did. I clicked something and I did something stupid. Keep going, Tanya. Okay. So I also think it's, an, you can move to the next slide whenever you figure out where you are. Yeah, but I got to figure that out. The uh, thing I really want to highlight is that when we talk about safety for marginalized identities and communities, it creates safety for everyone that's present and that percolates to every person there. So this is not just about safety for 
disabled folks or queer folks. This is about safety for everybody who is in your group. And very often, uh, uh, I'm sure like Graham can also speak to this, that you don't know what people are coming in with. You really don't. You don't know who the, the life experiences they've had. You don't know uh, what kind of complex trauma maybe they've been through as well, right? So it really makes sense to be complex trauma informed and to be um, inclusive and think about emotional safety because I really think it's important that we don't keep saying, oh, we're doing this for these marginalized folks. No, we're doing it for all of us. We're doing it for the safety of everybody that's there. And I really can't stress that enough. Because uh, when we used to work with take folks with disabilities out on adventures, we realized that uh, we also had elderly people like in their 70s signing up for our cycling expeditions. I also had my mom be really brave and sign up for this 500 kilometer expedition in the Himalayas. And she was, I think, in her early 60s then. And I think it gave that sense of safety to people who haven't done these things usually or before. You know? So really seeing that ripple that happens when we are uh, truly inclusive. So yeah, and safety, I think can, I mean, it can be, there are many different theories and studies. So there are terms like psychological safety and physical, emotional, intellectual, social safety. I know Denise, who's uh, had a really powerful um, influence on me uh, has also spoken about spiritual safety which is something I'm still learning about from her and what that means as well so these I think I see them all as like a Venn diagram that sort of intersect and interact with each other so I'm just going to give some examples you know to demonstrate the importance of these different types of safety just turning to examples where it was absent right so imagine a rock climbing outing where one partner chooses not to try a difficult climb for a fear of failure and embarrassment. Um, and that's about emotional and social safety, right? So um, maybe picturing a backcountry skier who didn't feel comfortable expressing concern to someone who was maybe more experienced before they dropped in and triggered an avalanche. And that's again a bit about feeling safe enough to speak up within a group and that's totally linked to physical safety. Um, you can also maybe take the example of a group of cyclists whose uh, you know, collective like machismo and their individual fears of being perceived as weak cause one of them to push too hard for too long before getting a heat stroke on a hot day and feeling very dehydrated. And so for me, when I'm running a group, I think it's a really good sign when people can stop and say, hey, I think there's a pebble in my shoe or I think there's a, I can feel a hot spot or a blister coming up and create, I know that's when I've created or somehow we have all collectively managed to create enough safety for them to say, I want to stop because it's not easy in a group where you're new and you don't know anybody to be like, oh, okay, I'm going to slow everybody down and I want to look after myself and check in on myself. And so I think there are these little ways that are, there's actually really uh, ways to check in whether your group is feeling safe and even role model that. So I think emotional safety is serious business and it's and they're all linked and we really need to pay more attention to that. So uh, I'm going to share another short video and actually I think Anshu is here so that's awesome. It's nice to have you here Anshu. This is a, uh, Anju was a participant on our program and she's uh, given me permission to share uh, something that she shared on her social media after being um, in the program. And um, I think it, it's, uh, it really, for me, I just found it so powerful, her sharing, um, because it spoke a bit about these different, different types of safety that we spoke about. And Anju, I don't want to put you on the spot, but after the video, if you feel like talking, of course, I'd love to have you share, but totally don't worry if you don't feel like. Um, because I have put your caption in the next slide. So just in case you'd like to read it out or just uh, one of us can. Okay, so let me know if you can hear it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you 
Yeah. So, and she was super brave because that water was freezing. <laughs> it's always really cold. Uh, yeah. So, thanks for letting me share that. And um, actually, wanted to move to the next slide where she's written about her experience, and just have uh, one of you read it out, whoever or Anshu. If not Anshu, then anyone else, just to read. Um, the because the elements of physical, emotional, and social safety show up in this in some interesting ways. I can read it. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Sure. Okay. Last month, I walked into or jumped into different rivers with freezing waters. They were really cold. I'm not even exaggerating. During a slow retreat organized by Qualia. You can see me going through a few real raw instances of receiving permissions from a group of people who enabled me to make space for my fear. Their presence was so powerful and I received the permission to be scared, um, the permission to take time in their presence. They waited patiently. Permission for me to take it slow. I gently had myself talk, shared my discomfort with them, received reassurances and took time to focus on my breathing, among other things. Permission to slip, learn, laugh. How would I know if a rock was slippery until I actually sat on it? Believe me when I say the water was freezing, my bones hurt and I screamed the fear before I jumped in. The cold once is okay. The fear before I jumped in, the cold once I was in, and the feeling after, after I swam myself out, sat on a rock, felt the warmth of the sun against my skin. It was incredible. And all the while hearing cheers and woohoos that made me feel held. I couldn't have done it myself. I wouldn't want to. They're mostly people I connected with for the first time. How lovely. There was this one time I came out of the water and asked some, Hey, did you see me jumping like a little girl with so much joy inside of me? Please note, all of us were looking out for each other. If we felt a rock or area to be slippery, we shared that with the others so they'd be careful in the same spot. Some of them, especially those part of the Qualia team, Kareri Commune, um, that was the homestay that we were staying in as well, grew up in the mountains and knew where it was safe for us to jump or swim. There was always always the permission to not jump or to take a dip if we didn't feel like it and that was completely okay too thank you so much Anshu it was really nice to hear that in your voice since those are your words and it's really uh, so beautifully expressed and just gave me so much joy to see you having so much fun and feeling so supported so thank you for leaving that up for us and for sharing it yeah, it was so nice. Yeah. Um, so then we can move to the next slide. Um, so there's actually a lot in this presentation that I'm not going to be able to cover, is what I've realized. So I'm going to see how we do this. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about this neurobiology uh, of safety aspect. Um, so when Denise and I started uh, looking at choice and authentic choice, we also came across, uh, you know, just the research on it. Uh, and this one draws from uh, Deb Dana's work. And she talks about the three elements for nervous system well-being and their connection, context and structure and choice. So while we focus more on choice, I'm just going to uh, talk very briefly about the three of them and then you can of course please reach out to me I can send you the notes and the longer presentation as well um, so we know that how people feel impacts learning right so we know that if our participants are focused on and preoccupied with whether they're feeling safe 
and the energy is being spent on attending to potential threats in the environment, they're not really going to be uh, able to be present to the process of learning and healing. And there's, a, there's plenty of research also that shows that. So we need to focus on reducing stress and establishing a positive emotional climate in the outdoors um, also. And instead of, you know, because essentially a lot of programs look at um, at almost like creating stressful situations for people to navigate, but I'm looking at it from a different, from a somatic perspective. I think there's a lot that's possible if our nervous systems are not just preoccupied with, am I safe and am I okay? And moving beyond that. So uh, drawing from this work, I think that, you know, we can advocate to make the adventure therapy space conducive for human system well-being and also conducive for meeting challenges and working with stress because actually um, just as we saw in the video before this adventure therapy does provide a really great uh, sort of medium to figure out our relationship with stress and we're not trying to take that away entirely but we're also trying to find that that balance um, so I'll just start with talking a little bit about connection and we know that Connection is essential for our nervous systems to feel safe and that we are co-regulating with each other all of the time. And uh, also that these spaces are, a, a, are an opportunity for people to form healthy relationships as well. So I think it's really important that as facilitators, we are feeling regulated in our nervous system because our participants are co-regulating with us and also with the natural world at the same time. And I know that I'm a better therapist outdoors than I am online, that's what I think. I feel more, uh, I feel way more grounded and centered within myself than when I'm sitting. Like, I feel like if I was outdoors with all of you having this conversation, I would be so much more relaxed than if I'm just not moving around and I'm behind a screen. So I think it's important to know where, as a practitioner, you function best. And I think I've learned a little bit about this um, also from Stefan, from Will, uh, from Graham as well about, I think Stefan, you spoke about knowing your adventurosity. I remember once in one of the workshops I've attended with you. And I think that's also important, right? Like knowing our technical boundaries and where are we most present? Where are we most comfortable? So I think um, that's important. I think it's really important to have fun as well uh, because if we're not having fun, then then I think there's something that we need to look at a little bit and see. Um, the next point is about context and structure. And I think basically to feel safe, human beings and nervous systems need structure. Um, so uh, there are some ways and that we can provide that structure. It's often like I'll take the opportunity to uh, also connect with people before the program one-on-one. -on -one. I'll give, uh, and there are some, you know, I'm sure if you've run a program, you know, like that different people ask, um, have the need to ask different questions. And some people ask a lot of questions and some people are like, ah, I'm just going to come and figure it out and wing it and we'll see. Uh, but really attending to those questions is a way of providing context and structure, right? Because um, I think it's this whole process of building a relationship and this, of course, ties into connection as well. It begins way before you even meet a participant. It begins the moment you have that first conversation with them over the phone or however. So I think um, I really found that there are different ways to provide context and structure. And we'll talk about them when we look at the practical uh, tools and tips as well. Um, and now with choice, I think the thing with choice is that too much choice feels overwhelming and too little choice feels also very overwhelming and restrictive. And it's important to slide on that spectrum and figure out um, how, how much choice we need to offer to people. But basically, uh, for many reasons, having choice is a fundamental human need and it's central for the nervous system and allowing a sense of agency and safety. And when choice is restricted or taken away, many people systems enact a survival response, and that results in a simple, like a sympathetic uh, fight or flight response or a disconnect and shutdown. 
and so they're no longer present with you. So I think people are far more likely to stay regulated and feel safe if they believe that they do have choices and options and not just perceived choice, but actual choice. And there's so many nuances to that. So hopefully that paper will be out at some point and I can um, share it with you all because we really got into all of the different layers around choice and how do we create that? And how does it tie into uh, supporting folks from marginalized communities to feel safe and so on? Um, so yeah, um, we can move to the next slide. Can I, I think... add a really quick an anecdote here? I, I, I am a massive nervous flyer, which is why I'm married to a travel agent and moved as far from my home as possible. And my my wife is not a nervous flyer. And I have never learned in a better way how anxiety is communicated non-verbally than me making my wife anxious with no words. So even just Renee sitting next to me on an airplane, I will make a stranger nervous on an airplane by no verbal or physical communication at all. So it is massively important that we regulate that. Um, anyway. Thanks for sharing that. I think this is so true. And I think that's why I'm a better therapist when I'm out in nature, because I am way more relaxed. So yes. that's where I feel like I'm more supportive to other people as well. Um, and I really like this term, co-adventuring. So uh, again, I think it was Will and Stefan and, and Ram who came up with it. And I... I want to borrow from it because I want to talk about how important it is to collaborate with the people we're working with. I also uh, came across uh, Luke Peters and Martin Ringer's work on seeing the group as a co-facilitator. And I think that's super important because I really see this as a process of co-creation and that automatically um, restores and, and acknowledges a sense of agency and acknowledges agency that exists within each of the participants, right, when we do that. So really seeing um, what we offer as a co-creation. And I, I often feel like even if one participant wasn't present, it would be a very different experience, right? Like it's just that combination of all of these people coming together, this specific bunch of people coming together that creates um, this experience. Um, and I also believe in not being an authority on nature or bodies, because I think often, you know, if you're an outdoor guide or adventure therapist, people will ask you questions and sometimes people feel like they should know all of the answers. And I'm really happy to be like, oh, I don't know what that plant is or, oh, I don't really know, uh, you know, little things about, I don't know everything about uh, nature. It's not like that. I want to leave room for discovery for people to, for us to have questions together and hold those together. And I believe that creates a more emotionally safe environment. And the same with bodies as well, right? Like we are not, even as a somatic practitioner, really leaving agency with people on hey, uh, you know your body best. I don't know your body best. I know a little bit about the nervous system and how we tend to respond uh, under stress or in specific situations, but really leaving that, leaving people as the experts of their lives. And that's another narrative therapy thing, I think, to just acknowledge that people are the experts of their own lives, their own bodies, and that nature is something that all of us can have knowledge about. Um, so we can move to the next slide. I'm gonna quickly go through some tools. Some of them we've already discussed. So I'm not going to spend uh, too much time. And I'd love to have you all add to this because I'm sure there are lots more that I have missed. Um, but And some of them are pretty basic, right? Like being welcoming and supportive and respectful of each person, uh, inviting people into conversations, navigating consent with care, because uh, again, I feel we don't always know the history of people who are coming. We, it's often revealed to us as they get begin to feel safe with us. Uh, and that's happened so many times on a program. So how do we then from the beginning set the stage for that safety is something that I feel a whole research paper can be written just about that. Uh, narrative therapy also reframes resistance. So there's again a lot that you can look at. So we don't look at resistance as 
um, we I, I spoke a bit about this earlier. It's more about reclaiming agency and pushing back to reclaim that agency uh, for people. So we don't look at people being clients being difficult or being hard to work with. It's it's not their problem. It's a I mean it's it's something we need to navigate and figure out how to frame that for ourselves. You know, so not pathologizing people for that. And something again that I think um, Will and Graham also talk a lot about. Um, yeah, facilitating informed decision making and encouraging ownership of choices and creating and giving choices wherever possible. And again, like it's not that there are clearly places and times to not give choice. And there's something called uh, more like assertive care, uh, which is a term we also uh, explored when we wrote about choice, which is about we're not giving a choice as outdoor leaders about whether you're wearing a life jacket. Uh, I'm often not giving a choice about whether you should put on a jacket when you come to camp uh, if you've been uh, really sweating and hiking because, yeah, you're going to fall sick. And assertive care is important. It provides context. So assertive care is also actually makes our participants feel safe because they are coming to us as experts, you know, right? So we can't completely take that away. And at the same time, uh, it's important to know when you don't give a choice and when you do and discerning that. Um, is something that I think uh, we should have more conversations about. I learned from Nevin Harper about assessing clients' ecological identities. And I think that's also about safety and inclusivity, right? Because this whole thing of, yeah, the outdoors are not for everyone. I know that if someone tried to send me to outdoor therapy 10, 15 years ago, I've been like, no way, I'm not doing that. Um, and it's important to know the history and the existing relationships that people have. So, yeah, you can move to the next slide. There are quite a few of these, so I'm gonna maybe skip a few because I just wanna leave room for one or two questions if possible. Um, this book is amazing and uh, it's recently been published um, and uh, it's basically a, a guide, a field guide that contains lived experiences of folks um, from different communities and people who worked in the outdoors. And it's really like a, something you can, you know, read and discuss around the campfire. So I would highly recommend looking it up. Um, and uh, I think Denise has helped to edit it and invited people to write um, about their story. Um, so I found some of it very, very relatable because often it feels like uh, there's some kind of loneliness when you don't have too many practitioners who look like you around and it's nice to know that that people from different marginalized identities are having similar experiences and there is a shared experience around that as well um yeah i think using uh, invitational language and being tentative is important also sometimes to you know always give say option a b or c it's never just a or b you know to open up possibilities and again restore agency and that creates emotional safety and really honoring lived experience over theoretical knowledge is something I really try to do in programs because often we also have mental health professionals as participants and I really make it a point that we don't get too carried away into what is true for me because it can feel quite um, scary to other people who don't know these theories and they can feel quite excluded if we start talking about um, you know at that level so I really try to bring it into the everyday and uh, what that looks like for people um, yeah I think it's important to engage with diversity equity inclusion and belonging work and uh, intentionally learn about and interact with folks who aren't from the same community as you and there's always so much learning that can come from that. And we talk a lot about brave spaces where we allow ourselves to question what we know and uh, make room for different possibilities as well. And of course, I think Stefan mentioned in the chat earlier about co-creating like group agreements. And I think that's something that's again, very important, right? Um, so yeah, we can move to the next one. It's the last slide. Um, I'm just going to look at the ones that we haven't maybe spoken about. Checking for accessibility needs is really important. Um, 
not just for people who have disabilities, but for everybody to really describe the trail and give that context and information as much as possible. I know I've been really annoyed before in the past when I've been with uh, led by someone in the outdoors and they withhold information about how much of what the trail looks like or how much more there is to walk. And that's there's this like a whole uh, power play that can happen between leaders and facilitators and participants, right? Like it's important that you tell people so that they can prepare and they're not just wondering and left confused. So um, there's a lot to be said about not intentionally causing turbulence and discomfort for people. And I think in the field of adventure therapy, we really need to have conversations about this, about uh, creating spaces where we give information to people and not withhold it. Um, and that again, helping to make the environment as stress-free as possible. Um, and yeah, I think Will will be really happy that I've mentioned being feedback informed uh, because he loves talking about that. And I think that's important as well. And not even just in, of course, there are, uh, you can reach out to Will if you want to know about very structured research-based ways to do that. But I think there are little ways we can even just create an environment where we check in you know, even just verbally, it doesn't always have to be a very formal process. And there's a whole spectrum of ways in which you can engage with being feedback informed. Um, so yeah, I think that's important as well. Yeah, I'm going to pause here and uh, just see if we can quickly go over the next couple of slides, which is the last two, I think. And I'm happy to share these resources. So just feel free to read to me. Thank you so much, Tanya. I was thinking at the end when you talked about sharing the um, the trail with people. One, one young person I interviewed a few years ago said this to me for a piece of research, and this really stuck with me. And, and I thought this was such a sad thing to listen to. They said, they will, even if they're friends, and this was like a 22 year old young woman. And they said, even if my friends invite me hiking, I won't go. Because it reminds me of when I was tricked to go hiking in adventure therapy. And so it's not a, I often think it's not like a, um, like a social justice performance to share with people what you're doing. It actually harms people when we don't tell them. And we can think, well, I know this trail really well. I'll keep them safe. I'll be the hero. And the client might still feel really horrible on that trail. We have no idea what they're going to experience and what they're choosing to take part of. So I really liked that you said that. Um, because adventurosity, as Stefan says, is really about choosing what you're going to do while embracing that uncertain things are going to happen. Now, we have one minute left of our time. And I was wondering, we've had Graham, Doug, and Stefan here all week. I'm just looking at the participants. Um. I'm wondering if there's someone that we haven't heard from this week that has has one final question or thought for Tanya to respond to. You can put that in the chat box. And it's a no pressure question. I don't have a question. I just have a reflection as uh, Tanya was sharing. Um, yeah. I'm just realizing so much about adventure being a community activity and not a solo thing and uh, how much of that safety is in how the community sets it up um, just as an example of rock climbing the whole of last week and this idea of assertive care but also um, the idea of why you need it you know and, and just this idea of like why you need people spotting you while you're rock climbing or bouldering was so um to me felt so safe personally and it was also there was also choice of like 
we can see that you can make it to the top but i knew that if my hands can't hold i can fall and i'll be i'll i'll be held right and that was something um that really made me think about how most of the sports i saw the whole of last week in an outdoor festival were not were technically solo sports because the person is doing the activity but there are like five people watching and and i think the idea of code venturing and uh, the idea of um uh, uh assertive care to me right now is going hand in hand where i think uh i i'm i'm just kind of coming to terms with how it is enabling of emotional safety uh but at the same time it is also uh, making room for um what you were saying well about the uncertainties to happen and and both parties to have the space to say we don't know what's going to happen but we're going to support each other here with care and with as much information as possible of what can go right and what can go wrong um so yeah just just a re reflection thanks vinita for sharing that yeah i think that's awesome and i will i will just say before we wrap up tanya I, i really like this discussion and i know i am a bit i am comfortable in front of the computer um i have way i also have a ton of fun with you when we get to just be near trees anywhere in the world that we've been able to do that that i like to be outside with you as well and i know there are so many people here who have been impacted by your perspective and your work and and um i've been thinking a lot recently about how self care is not about as much about protecting us to maintain the status quo self care is activism it's the way that you keep your momentum um to change the world and so i think you do change it in so many ways as you've done for me so what a dear friend and thank you for doing this thank you so much for being here with you thank you Will. no problem and um i know there's a lot of people uh here and a lot of people who are going to watch this and i think all of you are also amazing as long as you really listen to tanya and do what tanya says and uh don't never sway from not listening to tanya otherwise you will be in the massive wrong um but i'm just joking no but tanya you are amazing thank you so much and and all we have left for social sciences week is Doug tomorrow and by all we have left that was very condescending as that left my mouth um Doug is amazing and so I can't wait for his presentation as well uh tomorrow morning you can all do the time zone math um uh, but Tanya thank you so much and I hope you have a, a wonderful afternoon and thank you everybody for coming and uh we'll upload this and and share with everybody as well uh tanya you're the best all right i will end it uh thanks everybody hope you have a good afternoon and evening <laughs>